after someone take a bit of liberties in stuff, however much he can. So if one of those had mentioned this morning, and if he did, that would go to the people's hours and would talk about the history and about the future of the Um Yeah, so this is a slide just to scare you. This is a list, and it's already two years old, <coughs> current or upcoming initiatives to like genome data um, from many international sources. Yeah, so there's no Swiss source here. So you can see there are lots of players, both in the commercial field, like 23 e as a permanente, or in the council data set, in the population studies, and you see there are numbers in the tens of thousands of each study, so lots of genomes are generally going to be about this. Um, now, several years ago, a uh, uh, number of people uh, recognized that there are lots of these resources being created and data sets being uh, produced. However, they all sit kind of in insulation, mostly due to security concerns, but also because lack of, there's a lack of incentive for each individual study to share the data and to provide the data. So, this was a reason for founding uh, the Global Alliance for Genome Health. Established in the spring of 2014. And um, the main topics, what the Global Alliance wants to address is to enable genomic data sharing for the benefit of human health as an overarching principle. And this involves working on very different fields. So this involves some genomic data on the technical side, how do you share data, what are the protocols for sharing data and accessing data. Uh, it's in regulatory and ethics to provide toolkits for people from many different countries which they can use to establish their own consent policies and so on based on, on blueprints which are regulated and checked at an international level. And this involves also work by people uh, interested in working on data security. And what should come out of this and it's a dynamic process. It's a federated ecosystem for sharing genomic and clinical data. It's a mix of things. It's not just about electronic health records. It's about having a balance of having molecular data and associated uh, clinical and also technical metadata. And one can imagine this then uh, working as a kind of layover over the over internet where the users have different accessories, different skill sets, and different intentions can make use of data in many, many repositories worldwide with their specific questions and their specific applications uh, using genomics API, for instance, beacon and query protocols or specific rare disease um, resource metrics, etc. And well now it's again the old slide doesn't matter. But this is um, this is basically a summary. So this is this is a representation of it. <coughs> I'm going to show you this morning, it's the Beacon Network, which is an uh, engine where lots of beacons are registered, and there are currently more than 90 beacons worldwide registered, and from more than 25 organizations and having more than 100,000 individuals represented in their data set somehow. And you see there are some of the participating and using organizations, Procter Exchange, for instance. <coughs> TCGA has a big uh, genomics project, so forth and so on. And the, the function was also demonstrated this morning already. In principle, you have a user which sends either a query to the Beacon Network uh, interface or API, which means some API, or you go directly to associated resources and which have their own interfaces and, and possibly all authentication systems. Now, um, when Beacon was brought up in already at the beginning of the global lens, as an idea to mostly it's, it's mostly as a social experiment, not so much as a scientific experiment. And the social experiment was how can we engage these people who are who are maintaining these resources to figure out if they can open their <coughs> genome data storage stores for queries over the internet. And this was inter interesting, this was the call was answered by, as I said, many uh, many organizations which made this available. The 
utility on the biological side is limited. You can just ask, do you have a single variant in a given position somewhere in your data? So as I said this morning, it's, yeah, it's not very useful. However, if it's a rare variant, you may find an organization which has an interesting genome, and then you may follow up on that in a manual fashion. And that's actually a bit like match network. It's also doing that uh, in a more controlled environment. Now, we have come to the point that this has to be improved to make real more practical use for research purposes and clinical purposes. And uh, recently, we had the 0 0.4 release, which will be generally. It doesn't be probably on this one, so it's a zero for the some of the first review of this, which starts with, you know, to expand the protocol uh, to, to allow resources to provide future data. And um, some of the features which are being added and already there or will be are on the roadmap for the future, of in the sense, the representation of structural variants, and this is possible now with the zero for four release. We want to implement metadata queries. I come a bit to that by how this can be problematic using structured uh, annotation systems, uh, ontology codes, queries, and so on. Uh, there is an already implementation on the ETA side of the layer of annotation systems for the different access layers of access as a possibility to put on weekends, and for example, ETA is using this. Um, Handover concept I mentioned will mention is quantitative tip responses and obviously ubiquitous the deployment. And you see Elixir now highlight so Elixir is the European Bioinformatics Infrastructure Network Organization. And Elixir is now a private <coughs> financing DP development. So the Global <coughs> Alliance has now a driver project, which is a democratic driver for schemas developed there, which is the Elixir DP which develops the beacon protocol, but the other contributors. Yeah. So uh, Elixir is now the main party involved in, in pushing this forward. What you can see here is our own representation of a test beacon. It, it's a bit beyond the protocol and implementing already some additional features like ontology queries and this quantitative responses, as I mentioned before. So we are having test deployments which are beyond. The 0 0.4 release, this is something which uh, I can demonstrate here, a new feature, which, as I say, is not really implemented in the backend, besides our own, and maybe some other test backends. We can do now not single uh, genome position queries, but one can consider the range of queries, and this can be useful, for instance, for looking for structural variants. In that case, we're looking with bracketing search, fuzzy search for a start and end, identifying anything that's overlapping of a certain gene here. And this is could be translated into a database query. So fuzzy matches and structural variant matches. Um, and another yeah, one of the next steps which is about to be implemented is to provide handover for the product. So if you think about being as a search engine for variants, you also think about oh now I found the variants, now can I get more information about the data? And we are of the opinion that beacon should be totally separated from uh, data delivery. So you should be able, through the beacon protocol, to learn directly to retrieve information about the patient. But it could provide the handover uh, mechanism, which leaves it then, leaves then the implementation on a, to, a, to another protocol. And this would be, for instance, an example of how this could look like. This related to some our public implementation. We just get an access handle to the data which was found, and then uh, this access handle can be used by an optimal authentication system to <coughs> provide um, rich data response, delivered data, visualized data, and so on. And these are actually live examples from our uh, structural learning databases, which are public data. Now, beacons uh, have been being discussed as security risks. So beacons run against aggregated data. So you have a data collection of hundreds of thousands or even tens of uh, genome variant sets and so called sets. And there have been immediately, actually before beacons were launched, we already discussed that there will be these types of patterns that you can use 
repeated queries to get this uh, single nucleotide variants in this chromic collection. And if you have enough rare variants or enough variants at all, you may identify that a given individual is part of this collection. So you can identify it. And this was then shown in 2015 in this paper by Carlos who basically uh, quantified the risk of how many queries you need to identify an individual anonymous. And it's, if you have a number of some 3,000 slips or so, you can identify individuals, or a probability for the relative to be in the, in the uh, collection. And there have been now better methods which are way more efficient at this, focusing on the relative. Uh, then there were discussions about how to mitigate this, and then the was uh, the link of the on the publication here, launch publication, analyzing different mitigation strategies, uh, for instance, by having not giving information about the type of population in it or not giving always correct information uh, about connected SNPs or um, where, uh, setting very budget so that you cannot do so many queries, which obviously can be had by the so, in principle, mitigation strategies exist, but all of them have some disadvantages. Another way of protecting is obviously authentication. This is here from the can which basically is on their authenticated services. So, what is the privacy? Is there, we have to ask ourselves now, is there a practical risk of identification? It's complicated, but it's theoretical. You can do it, but is it as a play? Of reality, um, and how much will now extension of the protocol? This is what we are very interested in. How much will the extension of the protocol contribute to make identification easier? And will this change the design strategy? However, you first need a genome to identify the protein. And this is also getting easier. This is just a pointer towards one of these Yannick uh, Ehrlich projects, which he Published website in 2016, the paper came out recently. But they basically showed that you can, with rather cheap and easily accessible technology, you can do field sequencing of the human genome and run it against a variant set which you know and to identify if this person is in your environment. So you can get genomes and run it against. Now, maybe done. Uh, however, Lots of genomes are flying around. This, I, I actually like this. My heritage just announced a Valentine's kit. So send somebody your, uh, your DNA test kit, test kit to you know, see if they are really related to you. <laughs> <laughs> and right, I, I did it and yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> find out the 23 and me answers to the average British process DNA. So, 36% which is such a nonsensical sentence, but it's actually good to understand the uh, message behind it. So, uh, so we know this. We know beacon concept is a balanced, interesting approach, in our opinion, to make data collections accessible to research. And however, there's always an inherent risk of uh, being identified and linked to a person, no matter what you do. This came up several times. It's just how hard is it, and, and how how valuable is it for the attacker to do this? So, so we choose from technology or society. That's the main question actually we have to address. There have to be technological components, but the discourse is an important part of it. And obviously, people start to think differently about what they share, and you have to see the risk from the DNA that being identified in context to from since you do or what who you are being identified from the, all your the other profiles you have the thing of that's also decisions by the public. Okay? So last slide uh, these are the currently working people working on the people project. Not all of them are from the here, they're also uh, people that like Mark and we all from the ASAP original logic original Somebody from my group, and there are some links here on the site. What up in the slides are already online. I tweeted this before the talk, so 